This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With the built in HD camera and microphone, you can monitor your front door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like being home even when you're not. Right now, get $10 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash knowhow. And by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for the right payments API, check out the Braintree V.0 SDK. With one simple integration, you get every way to pay. To learn more and to try out the sandbox, go to braintreepayments.com slash knowhow. On today's know-how, we've got rat brains. Something about PCI stuff. Your questions and our answers. Wow, it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballos here. And I'm Brian Burnett. Uh, you may you may have noticed, I don't know if you've noticed, Brian, but um, we're not at our regular radio corner. This isn't normal. This is norm not no well, I mean we're not normal, but this is definitely <laughs> right, this abnormal. Is, uh yeah, why why would we do this, Padre? Oh, uh, we would do this because we need to try out studios to see what else we could do. We've been in the radio corner for so long. We wanted to sort of stretch our wings and, and you know try out Studio B, <laughs> Studio C, maybe Studio D. Just stretch our wings by sitting down, yes. and it might not even be a Twit-owned studio. We could probably go to other we people's could be, We could be anywhere right now, yeah. And also because we're really tired and we needed to sit down. Yes, yes. So if you see us slowly closing our eyes. That's just, that's, that's just, normal. Yeah, it's totally normal, totally normal. You know what's not normal? Uh, <laughs> rat brains? Rat brains. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I thought... This was, this was a story we picked up a while back. It's actually not new. It's something that IBM has been working on for quite a while. They've been working on digital neurons. Hmm. So that's rethinking the way that we design the computers? Correct. Now, when we think of standard silicon, so uh, digital I.O., memory, right. ICs, it's essentially ones and zeros. It's, it's, a, it's a logic. It's a logic-based flow. So right. if this, then that. If that, then this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which works really incredibly, exceptionally well when you are doing logic-based problems, like mathematics. Mathematics is all logic-based. It all follows a regular flow. Right. You can do that incredibly quickly with an IC. In fact, modern ICs can process data like no one's business. But the problem is we've moved beyond just wanting to process data and now we want to recognize patterns. And for patterns, digital logic, not so great. Right, but something more like a, a physical brain is much better at finding patterns. So much better at finding patterns. Now, the way that our neurons work is it's not just yes or no, on or off, if this, then that. There's, there's association between neurons because what they do is they, they learn to, to, to recognize patterns. Now, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. If I needed you to figure out what a chair was <laughs> so that you could identify a chair anytime you walked by one, right. if I did it in the old way, the digital pattern way, I would essentially have to program in everything that a chair might possibly look like. Right. So you have like a bunch of pictures that would be scanned by the computer and then identified through that. Exactly. Which you can do. And because you could do it at such a fast rate, it, it is possible, but it's right. very cumbersome. And it's kind of non-intuitive because, I mean, you can always have a chair that doesn't look quite like a chair, but right. we still recognize as a chair. Because the things that you need to have for a chair is so, like someone can sit in it. See, exactly. Right. You know, and, and, you know, at some point a stick can be a chair if right. you set it upright. But to have a computer think like that, to be able to look at something and say someone could sit there, that could be a chair. Exactly. And that's what IBM has figured out. They've <laughs> created neurons that could, say, be described what a chair should do, and it will recognize the patterns of chairness. It's kind of like philosophy. I mean, really, it's getting back to like high school philosophy here. <laughs> this, is, this is Socrates. What is a chair? What, what makes, what makes chair? chairness? Well, no, but what IBM has done is they have recreated a rat brain, 48 million neurons, which is what you would typically find inside of, of the brain of a rat. And rats are fairly smart. They're, 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 you know, rats, can, see, rats are great analogs in, in science because they can problem solve. If you put mm -hmm. a rat in a maze, it will 
by process of deduction, figure out how to get out of the maze. Right. It won't just keep bumping into the same wall over and over again. It will actually dedu it'll use some, some problem-solving logic. And sense fix. patterns. And in, sense in a, patterns. In a maze and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. And their new silicon makes 48 million digital neurons. Works much the same way that the neurons in a brain does, except they're, they're on silicon. Hmm. Okay, but then when you compare that to a human brain, it's a lot less, right? Yeah, so a uh, uh, human brain is about 100 uh, billion <laughs> okay. neurons. So there's um, a little bit more there. Yeah, uh, and a you know, uh, human brain also has about, what, what is it, uh, 100 to 1,000 trillion synaptic connections. So they're not anywhere near creating a human brain mm -hmm. that can do human reasoning. But even, even the ability to create a silicon chip, a solid state chip, that can do pattern, simple pattern recognition. If you merge that with what we have on the digital side, so mm -hmm. the ability to do if this, then that logic, that's incredibly powerful. Imagine having one side of, the, of your chip, one side of your brain, <laughs> can do all the mathematics, and the other side can do the applications. Right. What do those mathematics mean? That's kind of the holy grail of computing right now. Ooh, so we're getting closer and closer to the machine takeover then, right? Well, maybe not the machine takeover, but we're definitely <laughs> getting closer to having, for example, in our phones, mm -hmm. processors that can do spikes of, of processing, that can do pattern recognition for us, and can use much less battery power. Hmm. Because unlike, say, a standard I.O., traditional silicon, right. which is running all the time, you can have a neural net computer that only thinks when it needs to think. Wow, okay. So, yeah, cutting costs uh, as far as efficiency and, and pattern recognition. I don't know, though. It's also a little scary for me. It's a little scary, but uh, I, they're not going to be replacing us anytime soon. Hmm. Well, well, maybe me, but not you. Well, you've seen the, uh, the Google image recognizer where it shows <laughs> the eyeballs and things. I'm and dog pretty faces. sure that that would make the, the rat brain freak out as well. So, <laughs> uh, I don't like that thing. It, that's, that's nightmare fodder. It oh, really yeah. is. Hmm. Now, when we come back, we want to go ahead and talk a little bit about PCI lanes. This was a question that came to us because, well, we were talking about SSDs and SSD upgrades. And specifically, remember we had that beautiful Predator? That, yes. Uh, that SSD from Kingston. That, that I was so happy with that I carried around town with me. Oh, oh, wait, Brian. What? You mean you mean this what? one? Th this one here? Yeah. yeah. But no, no, can, it's no. so fast. It is so fast. But... Some people were asking whether or not this would be right for their computer. They didn't quite understand the discussion that we had with the folks over at Kingston. So we're going to jump back in and, and see if maybe they can clear a few things up. But before right. we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Know How, and it's the Ring Video Doorbell. Now, the Ring Video Doorbell is, well, it's something that everyone should consider. It's like having caller ID for your home. Now, what does the Ring Video Doorbell do? do? Quite simply, it allows you to install a piece of hardware at the front of your house or the back, wherever your door may be, that can will replace the traditional doorbell. And when someone rings that bell, it will actually signal your phone, your tablet, your mobile device, and you can start a two-way conversation so you can talk to the person who's there. Uh, it, it's not just that. It also does motion sensing. So if someone comes into range of your Ring video doorbell, you'll be able to know and you'll be able to record it. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that Ring really feels deeply about. They want you to have a system so that you can check on your home even when you're not there. Now here's, here's what the kit looks like. It comes with the Ring video doorbell and it's also going to come with all the tools that you need to install it. Everything from the drill bits to the, uh, the leveling tool and to the back plate that allows you to charge the doorbell off of house current. Uh, if you don't have house current, you can use this thing right here, Brian. It's, yeah, it's a, a little USB you, micro USB connector, yeah, yeah, which allows you to charge this up for a year, a whole year of power off of a single charge. It then connects to your Wi-Fi system, and you can contact your Ring video doorbell anywhere in the world. Uh, once you have that, just install the application on your phone. And, like, for example, uh, you, if you've watched Know How before, you know what I'm going to do right now. I've got my parents a Ring video doorbell because I was worried about their safety. I, I didn't want shady people casing the house while they were out. So I installed a Ring video doorbell, and now it shows me whoever shows up at the front door. i got to tell you, I, I swear by this thing. I, if, if I'm going to trust my parents with it, you can uh, bet that you can trust yours. Now... If you want total convenience, if you want an easy way to make sure that your home is secure, if you want a way to have caller ID for your house, I urge you 
to try the Ring Video Doorbell. It, is a, it was named as one of the top gadgets of 2014. It comes equipped with an HD camera and night vision LEDs. It's really what you need if you want to move your home to the next level. Now, right now, you can get $10 off the normal price. Just protect your home and have peace of mind with Ring. Now, right now, you can get $10 off the normal price because they love the Twit audience. Protect your home and have peace of mind with Ring. Go to ring.com slash knowhow. That's ring.com slash knowhow. And we thank Ring for their support of knowhow. Hey, Brian. What's up? You, uh, you want to play with some SSDs? I do, but... Like the people asked in the audience, I'm not 100% sure if I have the required equipment to use this. This is actually a big question because people were saying, oh, well, your PCIe is going to be better. PCIe is going to be faster than what I got. Maybe yes, maybe no. We went ahead and spoke with our friends at Kingston, and uh, they helped us to clear up the mystery of the PCIe bus. I'm here with Cameron Crandall from Kingston. Well, I, I say that three times fast who's going to explain to us what lanes are and why we need them for the latest generation of Kingston SSD products. Cameron, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Now, we, we know this because we've, we've seen this on several of our shows. Before you buy, on know-how, we know it's fast, we know it's wonderful, we know we want it, but what do I need to make this work properly in my desktop? So first you need a, an available PCI Express slot, okay. either um, the standard half height, half length, or uh, the M.2 form factor, which you were just holding here. Um, and the, the other key thing to get the full performance out of the drive is to uh, make sure that you've got a number of available PCI Express lanes available to you. The, uh, yes, this is important. Actually, when I was doing my review of the Predator, I wanted to put it into, a, I had a Predator desktop from Acer. I was going to put a Predator and a Predator. You know, like, but the problem I ran into was it had PCI Express two lane, and okay. I couldn't use that because I, I would not get the full performance, right? So you can use it, you just won't get the full performance of the drive, right? What could I get? What would, so I know that this is 1400, 1000. 1400 read, 1000 write. What would I get if I plug that into a PCI Express 2? Half the performance. Really? Yeah. Whoa. Okay, so this has always been a little mystical for me. How do the lanes work? Just, I know more lanes are better, but why are more lanes better? What does it actually, what happens on the inside? Uh, any system um, that you build, you, you only get a certain amount of PCI Express lanes available to you. Mm -hmm. So if you're consuming those lanes with uh, one, two, or even three video cards, you're consuming a lot of those lanes. So um, you just want to, you know, verify, you know, before you install the, 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 the Predator, if performance is important to you, that you are that you have at least four lanes available to you mm. to get the full performance out of the drive. Uh, why why is it that some desktops will have a lot of PCI Express slots and some won't? Is it is that just a cost saving feature? Is that just a feature set that they decide on, or do you actually have to go through a lot of work to make sure you have say three PCI Express 16 slots and two eight slots and three three four slots? What's the limit? It depends on the processor and the south bridge. Okay. Okay. So we get uh, PCI Express lanes from uh, from both the processor or the south bridge. And if you look at the technical specs on the system, uh, you'll see how many PCI Express lanes that are available on that particular system. The M2 format is still relatively new when you compare it to say M SATA or you know, SATA. Yep. I'm starting to see it show up on more and more computers. I'm actually starting to see it in a couple of laptops, which has me very excited. Mm -hmm. But do I have to worry about, there's, is, is there going to be an M2 4 lane, an M2 8 lane, M2 16 lane? Is that going to be revved up or is M2, M2, and I don't have to care about what else there is? So um, certain motherboard manufacturers will configure the M.2 socket for either two lanes or four lanes. Ooh. So if you did have a system that had an M.2 socket but it only supported two lanes, you may want to go to the adapter, which would give you the full the full four lanes. Is it just PCI Express in a different form factor? It is. It, it is. is. Yeah. So so electrically, it's just it's, a it's smaller socket. Exactly. Oh, okay. I, I like that. Yeah. Now, last question. Now, let's say someone is looking at upgrading their system. They've got a PCI Express four slot. Uh, now they're also considering maybe just using a bunch of these in a RAID configuration. Mm -hmm. I've seen, in fact, at CES, was it three, four years ago, I think you yep. created this wonderful monster box. How many, how many SSDs did it have so in that it? that was 16 SSDs. 16 SSDs, and what was the performance? We were getting about 4,000 megabytes a second. Which, which is ridiculous, but it's, yeah. it's wonderful. So let's say they wanted to create one of those. 
Would you say to go with a bunch of SSDs, put them in a performance raid, or are you still saying, no, you got, you got to go with the Predator? You know, uh, Predator um, can still be made faster. So if you, mm. if you, if you raid Predator drives together, um, you know, that, that PCI Express bus just offers just so much more performance over a single SATA port. Um, you can still build a faster array with Predator drives than you could with, with SATA. The advantage you would have with SATA is you do have you're not going to run out of PCI right. Express lanes, right? So right. if you have a multi-port um, SATA controller or RAID controller, you can typically scale out more physical devices where you would run into some sort of a, a barrier with, with PCI Express as you ran out of lanes. Yeah. Where else can you go with this? How much faster can you make this particular technology? I mean, we know that we sort of hit the, the performance limit as far as the old SATA drives are concerned. These are still great, they're still fast. We're going to see these for years and years to come, but they're not going to give us another rev of SATA right. that, that we're stuck with the 550 limit. This seems so much faster, but am I just going to hit the wall again with this in a year or two years? So uh, the PCI Express interface is evolving, right? Mm -hmm. We're at uh, uh, PCI Express uh, Gen 3 now. Uh, Gen 4 is being worked on right now. So every time we go to a new generation, we double the, we double the bandwidth per lane. Um, so right now, Predator is a uh, Gen 2 by 4 configuration. Uh, we will be coming out with a, uh, a Gen 3 by 4 configuration, which will double the performance. So if we're getting 1,400 megabytes a second now out of the drive, we'll be getting nearly 3,000 megabytes per second out of a, out of a Gen 3 device. Um, so yeah, so as the PCI Express interface evolves, um, it's giving us a, a fatter pipe to work with for, for SSD performance. Cameron, thank you very much for talking to us, clearing up some of the mystique over PCI Express connected SSDs. I guess uh, maybe the takeaway could be more gen, more lanes, more better. Yep, exactly. There you go. Back to you, Padre and Brian, over there. All of that was a long way of basically saying that if your computer is so old that it's still stuck on, say, PCI Rev 2, Gen 2, you're not going to get the full effect of something like this Predator. I mean, mm. this, this is a nice piece of hardware, but if you don't have enough lanes that are fast enough to allocate to this, it will default to the, the slower speed. Right, so it's not worth it. It's getting bottlenecked. Yeah. But it is a worthy reason for me to upgrade my computer now. It is, and I mean, you, you will get some performance benefit because it is still going to be faster than what you can get off of a standard SATA bus. Yeah. But... You, you are wasting a lot of the headroom of this. Because I mean, remember, I mean, if this, this needs 4x uh, PCI lanes, uh, if you don't have that, you're, you're basically chop the speed in half. So what you're looking for when you buy a mother, motherboard is a PCI 3.0? Yeah, you want, so you want PCIe, you want Gen 3. Mm, Gen uh, 3. You want something that's going to have a PCI 4 lane slot, an open 4 lane slot. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, even better. Also, you, if, if you're really shopping, if you're going to be customizing your PC, you're going to want something that supports NVMe boot, which not, I, don't, I don't actually have a motherboard in my lab that does that yet. Okay. Uh, the Asus X99 was supposed to, but I don't think it actually does. And, and the, the problem there is it's still a little nebulous because there are no bootable NVMe PCIe attached SSDs that do bootable NVMe. The Intel one is supposed to do it. I yeah. couldn't make it work. So would you wait a little while longer and get a standard SSD? No. No. no you no. say get it, this. It, it, <laughs> it is more expensive. So yeah, yeah you're going to be spending more. But if you've got the cash and if you've got a Revision 3 PCIe uh, Express bus on yeah. yours, I would take this over this any day. Okay. And this is fast. This is crazy fast. Right. And your use case is, or your dream build would be an editing machine using this. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's the other thing. We spelled that out in the video. Yeah. If you are just doing web surfing, you will see no gain. <laughs> no, no discernible gain. I mean, there will be technically be a gain, but no yeah. discernible gain over using a fast SSD. And, and this will be, you know, one fourth the price of, of that. So. Right. Go ahead and stick with, with standard SATA unless you have something that's very data intensive. That means video editing, mm -hmm. maybe gaming. I mean, it, you, you really only gain on the loads because once it's in memory, then you don't use it again. Right. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's, is it faster? Yes. If you need bragging rights, that's what you use. <laughs> but really, seriously, consider what you need versus the performance boost it's going to deliver. I could use another editing rig. Um... Mm -hmm. No, no, I don't think I don't think you could. We're just gonna 
We're going to keep that over there. Well, when we come back, we've got your questions, our answers. But first, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of this episode of Know How, and it's Braintree. Now, what is Braintree, you may be asking yourself? Well, Braintree is a way to get mobile payments on your application, your developed software, quickly. Oh, Braintree is an easy way to integrate these payments. Now, you, if in the old days, you may have had to set up your own backend server. You may have had to make well, some sort of relationship with a payments processor. And you definitely had to make sure that your infrastructure was up to snuff because you were handling the personally identifiable financial information of your customers. That's all bad mojo. We don't have to do that anymore. In fact, you shouldn't. If you're a responsible business person, if you're a responsible developer, you want to run, not walk away from having that kind of responsibility. That's where Braintree comes into play. Oh, Braintree is code for easy online payments. If you're building a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, you need to check them out. You owe it to yourself to check them out. The Braintree V.0 SDK makes it easy to offer multiple mobile payment types. You can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, and more, all with one single integration. Oh, they offer you secure, sim simple payments. It's code that you can integrate in minutes, and it uses tokens so you're not passing across any personally identifiable financial information. Now, if you're a developer, a real developer, you know that there are options out there that give you a solution, but they don't really document it. It's up to you to figure out exactly how it works and the best way to put it in. Well, no, that's not what Braintree does. They're not just going to give you full documentation of the entire SDK, but if you have trouble with integration, they'll actually sit with you and help you to figure it out. The Braintree code supports Android, iOS, and JavaScript clients. They've got their SDK in seven languages, .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. It's elegant code with clear documentation, and it's just 10 lines of in-app code. Now, right now, we want you to try Braintree. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept those multiple payment types, the ones that your customers want, all with one integration. From PayPal, Bitcoin, Venmo cards, just do 10 lines of code, and you'll be ready to get paid. With the Braintree V.0 SDK, one small snippet, and you're up and running in less than 10 minutes. Now, to learn more, and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to BraintreePayments.com slash knowhow. That's BraintreePayments.com slash knowhow. And we thank Braintree Payments for their support of knowhow. Hey, Brian. Yeah. You know what I like to do? Answer questions? I like to answer questions. Yeah, we got some feedback from some people in our G Plus community. And the first one comes from Ye Rob Yesta. He asks, what mini 20 amp ESC do you recommend for the Know How 250? I'm looking for smaller compact ESCs to save space and weight. I will still use the 2208 to 2300 kV motor. Okay, now this, this is actually a really good question because it requires us to do some of the maths. <laughs> yes, and I like So that. we won't be using the rat brain for we this We won't one. be using the rat brain. This, yeah. is, this is logical thinking. Okay. Now, we were recommending the Ready to Fly Quads 30 amp ESC just because mm -hmm. it has a lot of headroom. It is it kind of heavy. heavy. It's it solid. I mean, it's it feel, solid. It's well built. Yeah, yeah. The problem is that thing is, it weighs like 35 grams. Which, when you times it by four, it starts to add up. It, yeah. it adds up. And, and I understand. You, you mean... The reason why we suggested the 30 amp ESC for the Know How 250 build is because we wanted a part that maybe they could use on a future build. Right. Uh, but if, you, if you're custom designing your quadcopter, we, you, you know weight's the enemy. Yes. The heavier it is, the slower you're going to go, mm -hmm. and it also means it's going to eat up your battery more quickly. Yep. Okay. So what Rob wants is he wants something that's as small as possible that can still handle the power of the motor. Now let's, let's think it through. First. Let's consider how much power that motor will actually use. Now, this is actually, this is our quadzilla. This is our octo quad. Uh, uh, actually, it's not a quad. It's a double quad. It's, it's your quad a, it's on an quad. XA. It's quad on quad on quad. Yeah. This is, these are the motors that Rob's talking about. This is a ready-to-fly quads 2208, 2300 kV motor. Mm -hmm. This thing will pull 295 watts. Okay. Okay. So that's at maximum draw with the, with the largest prop that it's rated for. Uh, at the highest velocity, we'll pull uh, 295 watts through the ESC. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to remember, <laughs> you can pull, there's two ways to get more watts to uh -huh. the motor. One is to increase the voltage, and one is to increase the current, the average. Right. Right? Uh, and we talked about that in, in previous know-hows, what, what the difference is between current and voltage. Mm -hmm. uh, this ESC, this is a, a blue heli, 
That's a 20 amp ESC. We're, we've got the, the link right here. Uh, from Again, from Ready to Fly Quads. It's about the same price. It actually, it is the same price as the 30 amp, okay. but it's much smaller. I mean, if you look yeah. at this thing, four of these weigh about the same as, as one. one. Yeah, they look pretty tiny. They're tiny. And the reason why they, they can do that is because, A, they're only rated for 20 amps, so they don't have to have as large components. Right. B, these don't have a battery eliminator circuit. Uh, the 30 amp, it provides power both to the motor and back to the flight controller, which will also give power to the receiver. Right. These don't do that, so you need a separate power source for the flight controller and the receiver. In this case, I've got a, a little, uh, there's an adapter right here that pulls battery power from the battery and it feeds it into the flight controller. Okay. Now, this will do 20 amps. Now, the question is, is 20 amps enough for a 295-watt motor? <laughs> the answer is... Kind of? Kind of. Are you yeah. getting towards the You're limit? getting really, really close. Now, uh, if I put a 3S battery, so I'm pushing 11.1 .1 volts, mm -hmm. if I want to get 295 watts to the motor, that means I have to jack up my current, so I'm pulling 26.57 amps. That's way too much for this. You could burst. This could this can burst to like 30 amps, uh -huh. but burst is very short periods, not like sustained half a thrust. second or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's for like when you're punching. Okay. Now, what, what's the worst case scenario pushing too much power through the burn. ESCs? They'll, they'll just burn they'll up. Burn. They'll burn. And, and then, then you, you lose quad, that motor. Okay, right. you'll lose the motor and the quad will just fall out of the sky. Right. Well, because, I mean, no power, so right. it'll fall out of the sky. You, you really kind of want to avoid that. Now, that also depends on cooling because the more current you're pushing through this thing, the, the hotter, hotter it's going to get. get. Yeah. So if you can give it a lot of cooling, it will actually survive longer with more power. Now, mm -hmm. so a 3S battery, I, I'm not going to get full full power to my motors mm -hmm. because it's just too much current going through the ESC. However, if I use a 4S battery, that's a 4-cell battery, it's not 11.1 .1 volts, it's 14.8. And because I've upped my voltage, I can actually decrease my current to get the same amount of watts. On a 4S battery, 14.8, yeah. instead of pulling 26.57 amps, I pull 19.8. 9.3 amps, which is just under the, I mean, <laughs> the it's actually within the margin of error because remember, you're supposed to take about 20% off to right. rate it. Uh, but, but yeah, you can use these. Okay. Now, if you're building a racing quad, especially if, if you've decided to build yourself one of those, um, like the blackout quads on the, the nicer frames, right. you're definitely going to want to go with a 20 amp, something like this. Mm -hmm. Lighter, more flexibility, you will be running at the ragged edge. Uh, but if you're using a 4S battery, you should be okay. Okay. Well, if that's what you plan to do, and you know you're not going to expand beyond that, then it should be okay. You should be okay. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong with a custom-built craft. I mean, we're not yeah. talking about huge sums of money here. So if you have to buy you know, $40 of components again for another build, right. that, that should be okay. But I, <laughs> I do kind of like those. I, I have burned out two. Um, what were, you, were you doing quad on quad? Or? No, no, I was just doing racing quad. Oh, okay. I don't think it actually had anything to do with overdrawing. I think it had everything to do with the fact that I, I was being stupid. <laughs> well, specific, specifically, well, stupid. Uh, I, I designed it so poorly that it was getting very little airflow from the props, and so it just burned. Oh, uh, okay. So if you're, if you're going to pull a lot of power, just cool it. Make sure it's, like, these are in the upper arms so that they're going to get the drown, the direct downdraft from my props. If they're underneath, they, they'll get a little less right. airflow. I was actually experimenting with, like, mounting heat sinks on these. Yeah. It doesn't, nah, What if you remove the plastic and move the zip tie over? You don't really get a whole lot of, I tied that. You don't get yeah. a lot of extra cooling and you lose a lot of protection. Mm. Well, just go for it. Just go for it. <laughs> just try it. Sorry if it blows up. All right. Well, moving on to our next uh, feedback. This is question. a big one. This, this, this is something that has happened to a lot of members <laughs> of our audience. So we thought that we had to finally address it. Yeah. This comes from Steve Pryor, uh, and he asks: With the KH250 build, I'm noticing that anytime I have a crash, my prop spinner and washer fly off. Even when uh, using Loctite Blue on the threads, the build doesn't provide the uh, CW, CCW? Yeah, so clockwise, clockwise counterclockwise and counterclockwise yeah. specific shafts. Should we be using shafts that will tighten, not loosen in the event of a crash and be less likely to spin off? Uh, so, Steve, don't crash. Right? Don't make a mistake and you'll be yeah. all right. All right. Moving on let's to the on. next question. No, let's go back to Steve's question. Okay, so no, this, th this is a serious question. A, yeah. a lot of people have been having issues with props flying off. And I, I haven't had that issue. You had it once, but you knew why it happened. I had because you finger tightened. 
I finger tightened and I had the dumb and I put <laughs> the uh, I put the prop underneath the washer. Or did I, no, I put the prop above the washer. You put the prop above the washer. Above the yeah. washer, yeah. And then I hand tightened it and it's flying through the field and it just looked like it got clotheslined. It just went right. Boop. Exactly. Yeah, quadcopters don't fly with three. <laughs> they should. They should, but they don't. <laughs> uh, now, uh, our audience has already come up with some really good solutions. Uh, some people will suggest Loctite Blue, but he's saying even with Loctite Blue, it falls off. Right. Other people like using nylocks. Those are the, the steel nuts that have nylon on the inside, and it really, it, I mean, those are hard to get on there. It right. really, really grips. That works. There is another solution. Thread specific. Threads that are specific to the rotation. Now, yeah. you can go to, to Ready to Fly Quads. Uh, right now, this is available for $3.50. Uh, I, I bought myself 10 of these things, just so I have them in my box. <laughs> Were you planning on losing some? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, they replace the stock shafts, uh, prop adapters that are on, on top of my quad. Uh, now, all of these on the top here are designed to turn clockwise. All the ones on the bottom Count. are designed to turn counterclockwise. So I replaced all of the, uh, the, the prop adapters on the motors on the top. And it's just four screws. I re remove four screws, mm -hmm. plug this in, tighten it with four screws. What it does is it means that, re remember, you want the prop, to, to the, the spinner on the top, to tighten as the motor moves in the direction it's going to move. Right. So the easiest way is hold the prop still along with the spinner, and turn the motor in the direction it's supposed to turn. If it tightens, it means that's the direction you want it. Because uh, the, the issue that people have is every time you goose the power, there's, there's inertia from the prop. It doesn't want to move faster. So what it's right. going to do is it's, gonna, it's grabbing that nut, and as the, the motor turns, it's going to slightly turn that spinner the other direction. Right. Uh, that's... That is no bueno. <laughs> that's that, when that is, props fly off. That's yeah. when props fly off. But if you have it set so that as you hold the prop and turn the motor in the right direction, it tightens, it means that that moment of inertia actually works in your favor. If the prop doesn't want to move, it will actually tighten the, the, the spinner rather than loosening it. Yeah, that sounds like the, the right way to go. Uh, were these very expensive? I can't remember. Three, 350 So, oh, okay. I mean, if you've got a quadcopter, it's $7 extra. Yeah, peace of mind, really. Yeah. And, and also, uh, the uh, Paul Baxter over at Ready to Fly Quads is pretty good. I think he actually does give you the option. If you want it, you can ask for clockwise and counterclockwise rotation prop adapters with your motors. Okay, so bundle it together. Bundle it together, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't really need it except for the crazy applications because right. most of mine have never fallen off. I've broken right. them. <laughs> well, like for my little 250, I don't remember what the motors are on there, but they're like half the size of these motors. And right. it, I don't need these for that. I can you just don't. use the nut as long as I don't hand tighten it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just uh, also use tool. tools are your friends. <laughs> <laughs> tools are your friends. Hmm. Yeah. I learned that lesson. I did it once, and I learned my lesson I after that. Never, so we'll never do it again. Never happened again. All right. Okay. Let's do one more. All right, last one. This one comes from T. Raburn. Any suggestions on a network monitor that can capture how much data each device on my network is using without having to install it on all devices? I know there is an app that I can download for PCs, but I want to monitor all the devices, including the Rokus, the Chromecast, and all on the network from one location. I have a Netgear WNDR3800 router, three computers, one Roku, two Chromecasts, two iPhones, and an iPad. This is a common question. Mm -hmm. we, we get this a lot. Uh, we actually did show people how to do this. It was, a, it was basically like a year and a half ago. Uh, was that with the, uh, the hub, the yeah. little network hub, mm -hmm. and then you were siphoning the data through that? Right, right. So we were using a tap, yeah. and then we were using Wireshark. Wireshark is actually a great program. Wireshark will capture all the traffic that's passing through it and will allow you to isolate which computers are using what, which which is actually quite nice. Right. Here's the thing, though. You, depending on what kind of traffic you want to record, you may have to tap in multiple areas on your network. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you only care about data that's going out because you, you're concerned that people are going to use up all your cap, right. then what you want is you want to put your cap between the network, your computers, including the wireless, and the router. Right. So, for example, if so, let's say this is my network and this <laughs> is my router. router. Yeah. I'd want to be in between the two because any data that flows between the outside and the inside, mm -hmm. that's what I'm concerned with. 
if you want to tab individual computers on their segment, so you, you want to know how much, how much data they're using inside the network, right. that's more difficult because the way that switches work, the way that networks work, the traffic that's going inter-node, like between two clients, may or may not pass down through where you've got the tap. Right. So would there be a way to monitor that through the router? Uh, only if you really sabotage your own network. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can force all the traffic to flow through one spot on the network, but yeah. then you are really, really sabotaging your, your throughput. Okay. Well, I mean, it sounds like the problem Redburn is having is he wants to know which, just what, how much data each device is, right. is capturing. So, so what I would do is, uh, here, here's the easiest setup, because I'm not going to suggest that you buy a tap that's going to cost you $1,000. I mean, I like those, but that's right. because that's part of my other job, and I just have those lying around. Find yourself a 10100 hub, not a switch. It's got to be a hub. Because what a hub will do is any traffic that comes in gets repeated out all ports. Uh -huh. What a switch will do is the traffic that comes in should only go out the port that, um, that it is connected to the device it wants to talk to. Right. It's, that's why it's more efficient. You, in this case, you want a less efficient device. <laughs> go figure. Don't hear that very often. You don't hear that very yeah. often. But, uh, and, and unfortunately, there are no gigabit hubs. There's only 10, 100 hubs. And you may, depending on how fast your external connections, if your external connection goes over 25 uh, megabits per second, you're actually going to start to cut into that a tiny bit because there's a lot of overhead with the hub. But what you want to do is have your switch that is connected to all your devices, including your wireless access point, mm -hmm. uh, then have the hub, then after the hub, have the router. It should be the only thing plugged into the router. In other words, all the traffic that goes between your network and the router has to go through that hub. And then you connect that hub to the computer that's running Wireshark. And mm -hmm. Wireshark will record every single packet that goes into and out of your network. And then we've done an episode of how to parse the data that you want through that on Wireshark. Right, right. So. And, yeah, and you can, you can, I mean, once you have the data in water, Wireshark, mm -hmm. you can parse it by IP number. Where, does it, where did it come from? Where is it going? Mm -hmm. uh, you could look at protocol. So how much of this is video traffic? How much of this is web traffic? How much right. of this is email? How much of this is IRC? How much of it is torrents? That's all visible because Wireshark captures everything, including the headers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's actually, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And I will say, we're going to tie this back into the container discussion we had last week mm -hmm. because you can run Wireshark in a container on a NAS and have it capture data that way. Oh, yeah. okay, I like that idea. And actually, you've got one of the know-how devices uh, at, in your home, uh, the Linksys AC... Uh, the WRT1900AC? Yep, yep. Yep, it's a beastie router. It's a beastie router, and technically, if they ever get open WRT running on that thing, mm -hmm. it should be able to do that. It's got the horsepower to be able to capture packets off of itself. Well, and we were talking about this earlier. You seemed a little hesitant to recommend this, but on the router, with the router software, it will show devices on your network and how much data they have consumed, but not 100% how reliable that is. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it gives you a rough count. Yeah. Uh, but it, it won't break down, like, what was it? What kind of traffic was right. it? Which it just is, shows the amount. Right. Okay. And, and a lot of routers will actually do that. It's That's not super, super helpful. I mean, unless you can actually have the device show you what the traffic is, it's just the number. Right, right. Yeah. So and, if the iPad has a bunch of, like, a really high number of download, you can probably assume that someone's watching a lot of videos on that device right. or something, exactly. but you won't know for sure unless you're using Wireshark. Ver yeah, versus Wireshark, which is saying, wow, why is it that one laptop did 90% of the data transfers on my network? And you're looking at it and, okay, well, there's no video traffic here. There's all this encrypted traffic. And you're thinking, uh -oh. okay, there's probably something wrong here. Right. Yeah, I should take a look at this because that might be a compromised computer that's exfilling a lot of data off my network. The other thing that you can do with Wireshark that you can't really do with the super simple basic tools mm -hmm. is you can look at uploads versus downloads and what's, what's happening. Mm -hmm. I would expect to see a lot of incoming traffic. Right. If I start to see... A, Way outbound. more outbound traffic. There's, yeah. there's typically two, two things that's possible. One is uh, someone did a crazy amount of down uploads. Like they're pushing out all their photos. Like they're, or they're doing like YouTube, like uploading a video to YouTube. Uploading or video. Like. But I mean, it would be a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or two, they're torrenting and they've, they've, 
downloaded everything and they're seeding and, uh, yeah, and all those torrents are now pulling out. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a third possibility and that is they've been owned and someone is now using that computer to pull off all your data. Right, or being used in a botnet or something like that. Right. Well, is it the, there's a third item that you probably wanted to mention. Is it the, the IDIS Guardian? Yeah, so uh, the IDIS Guardian, which we have played with here on KnowHow and uh, is actually done by a friend of the show, uh, Daniel Ayub does have the ability. It's, it's a Linux computer. Mm -hmm. It's a Linux computer with a really fast packet engine on it. And you can run packet capture tools on the box, natively on the box. Uh, now, I haven't done it yet, so I can't recommend it until I actually find out what mm -hmm. kind of performance it will give me. But that might be a super inexpensive way to both get a really nice router slash a security appliance and be able to tap your network. I just I want to make sure it works properly before I show it off. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the last uh, the, the recent stuff I've heard about the security, securing your own network is if your router gets owned, then you yeah. SOL. Yeah, the the what the the battle cry at uh, Black Hat Defcon has been who needs to uh, to hack the core if I own the edge. Exactly. Uh, and that the <laughs> idea is why would I go after the big servers if I can own every router that's currently <laughs> on the internet. And unfortunately right now the Consumer routers are not, in fact, even Soho routers have a really, really bad track record. There are so many vulnerabilities that uh, it's, it's actually kind of scary. <laughs> well, on an unscary <sighs> note, should we talk about beer? Let's talk a little <laughs> bit about beer. Because, folks, so next week we've got two big projects that are coming back. We're going to finish up the last two weeks of cooling. Remember, we promised you a month mm -hmm. of cooling. We had to stop because I almost electrocuted someone and I needed to... Yeah, who could have that have been? I don't know. Don't really care about that, though. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's, it's safe now, and so we're going to be able to show off. This, we've got two things. One is the cyborg cooling, which is going to be awesome. <laughs> the second thing is this. Uh, we did a beer lift with this, and you're going to see how successful it was. This is actually far more of a complicated build than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you thought it was just going to be a drone on top of a drone and you'd be done, right? Well, uh, yeah, because I was trying to sort of bend the rules of the competition. The, the rules of the competition, because I wanted to stay in the 250 class, mm -hmm. uh, and it could only be 250 millimeters prop to prop, right. diagonal. Um, but I was poking around in the rules, and there was nothing that didn't said you couldn't stack right. on top of each other. <laughs> Uh, so, I, yeah, I put a diatone frame on top of a diatone frame, and we got this Frankenstein's monster. It's essentially two know-how 250 quadcopters uh, with a shared power system with two 4S 100C batteries and uh, one single flight controller. Uh, believe it or not, this flies very strange. Yeah, well, all the propellers it, right? on top do clockwise. Clockwise. And then the bottom ones do counterclockwise. Yeah, so it, it's, it's weird. This yeah. thing sounds mean. It does. It, it sounds, sounds angry. It sounds very, very angry. And unfortunately, I can't even test fly it because the second you start bringing up throttle, yeah. it starts to take off. <laughs> there, there, is no, there is no, like, I'm slowly throttling up. Right. I need to put this thing under load before I, I actually take it out for a ride. Well, it makes sense because the load you are trying to carry is about 10 pounds. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and it wants, it wants the 10 pounds. Yikes. Uh, so we're going to show you exactly how we built this in, uh, in next week's episode. And <laughs> we'll see if it works. Uh, we'll see if it works. Uh, there should be some really good disaster video because. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. First but. couple of attempts, I, I, I see I've melted a power, I've melted an ESC, uh, blown a power system, I've snapped a frame. Yeah. It's amazing the amount of thought that you have had to put into the structure between the two quads. Because <laughs> the first one of like four sticks did not work. No, 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 no. Yeah. That's why they're not, it's not rotated on an axis. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, and we'll explain all of that next week. Mm -hmm. uh, also, coming up very soon, if, uh, if you like Docker, if you are thinking about upgrading your PC, we're including little vignettes. This is, this is heading towards our move to the new know-how. We will be releasing a few things that are going to be on the YouTube channel before they actually go out on the, on the feed. So Ooh. that was a good time to be part of the group. We're going to make sure it all ends up in the group. Uh, Brian, this has been a, a pretty long show. You know, yeah. We're trying to get it down there. But uh, we always make sure they have show notes. Where can they find those? Well, those are super important because we did talk a lot about links that you're going to need to find. And you can find those at twit.tv slash kh. That's uh, not only where the show notes exist, but all our prior episodes. So if you want to subscribe or download the uh, video of your preference, say you don't want the HD version, why I, 
I don't know why you wouldn't with these faces. Joe, don't get the HD. I look really <laughs> bad in HD. But maybe you're uh, monitoring your network and you don't want to hit your cap, <laughs> so you download the, the lighter version. Uh, you can find those all at our, our page. But that's not the only place that you can find content from us. No, you're, you're going to try to get us on our Google Plus group. It, mm -hmm. It's a fantastic place. I mean, it really is a community. In fact, I will say it is the most active community at Twit. Oh, it's, bar it, none. Way more than the This Is Twit group on Google Plus, and even more than the All About Android group, which is incredibly popular and incredibly active. We got over 9,000 people over who, 9, they're, yeah, they're constantly posting. Yes. And, and the nice thing is they're answering each other's questions. They're geeking out with each other. It's a great place to ask a question, to answer a question, or maybe to post pictures or videos. We love videos yeah. of your projects. Go ahead and, and maybe you'll end up on a future episode of Know How. Just make sure that you have uh, about an hour to dedicate yeah. because once you start thumbing through people's projects, it's a uh, deep, hole. dark deep rabbit hole. down the rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course, that's not the only place you can find us. You can also find us on the Twitters. That's right. I'm at cranky underscore hippo. And I am at twitter.com slash padre sj. It's a, it's a good place to follow us. So if you follow us, mm -hmm. you could find out what we're going to be doing each week. We're... We we're, we're kind of fun guys. Yeah, Funnish. I, I, I mean, <laughs> fun. I like to think so. I like to think we're fun, and we we do a lot of things outside of Twit. I mean, I do most of my things indoors, but you go outdoors every once in a while. Occasionally, yeah. but I, the example that comes to mind right now is that we went to VMworld. We did, and we ran into a few people, a yes. few fans and stuff. It was great meeting you. Thanks for saying hi. But if you want to contact us, uh, Twitter is a great place to do it. And by the way, folks, I, I just want to say if you find us at a live event, and we are doing more and more live events. That's one of the things we're changing here at TWID. Please, don't feel afraid to say hi. I mean, if we're shooting, we've got to finish the, sh the shot. Yeah. But <laughs> we, we love meeting people. We, we met like half a dozen people at VMware, VMworld, which I didn't think we would. That's not really yeah, a know how no. Valley Wick. But uh, they, they came up and they said hi, and it, it was fantastic. It's always nice to meet members of the audience. Yeah, part of the Know How crew. Yeah. Speaking of the Know How crew, there is one member who often goes without recognition. We wouldn't be able to do it without him. We really wouldn't. He is Alex Gumpel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And don't let this, this new studio fool you. He's here. He's here. He's hiding back there in the abyss. This is this studio, studio F? What is this? I, I, know, I, I forget. <laughs> it's whatever we want kill it to be. Me. Kill me. <laughs> studio Kill Me. You can find him at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3, an L3 on Twitter. And uh, it, it's actually follow him because you, you get to see the more serious side of know-how. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, no. <laughs> he, he says don't. Don't follow him. <laughs> don't follow him. Go ahead. Go ahead. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how. Stack on stack. Quad on quad. More is better. <laughs> <laughs>